We're here with the director of Robot Dreams, Pablo Berger. Pablo, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Hi, I'm, I'm so happy to be here in Toronto. Thanks, Jeff. I have to tell you, as a, as a diehard animation fan, uh, I loved this film, first of all, and it was also very special, I think, to have it play here. Uh, it feels like a rare opportunity whenever an animated film gets to be on the world stage, especially one like this where there's no dialogue and it feels uh, so much more like a quiet, sensitive uh, film. Can you talk about the, the, how special it feels to get to sort of have an animated project uh, be seen in, in this kind of light here at TIFF and as well as I can before? Well, it's, it's great. I think there's a lot of prejudice against animation. Uh, we can just remember Guillermo del Toro words, you know, animation is not a genre, it's a medium. It's not a genre, it has to be, we have to repeat it many times, genre is comedy, horror, mm. musicals. Animation can do any genre. It's just a way of telling the story and it's a very powerful way. I think I was very lucky that I could premiere the film in Cannes, that also there were only two animation films. Right. I think in Toronto there are a few more, but it's, it's nice that animation is part of the of the what we call normal festivals, you know, that, that they're all, they can be all part. So it's, it's great, I don't know. And if we think about other live action directors that make animation film, like Wes Anderson or Link Blanter or Fernando Treva just made, they all repeat, there's something about, oh, Guillermo del Toro, now he's, he's saying that he only wants to make animation, you know, but there's something about it that is it really, when you try it, you, you kind of like get addicted. I, I love as an audience, but as a director, when I can control the storytelling and work so close with the animators and you work for years and something about you get so close to the film that is it's experience that I'm, I don't know what I'm going to make next, but I know I'm going to make more animation films. I was going to say, I guess there, so there is more animation in your future then. <laughs> yes, it was Amazing. a very good experience. And I have some ideas in my head running, but I actually, I, I make so few films. I'm normally every time I make a film because I write and direct, I make, take me five years. So I don't know what I'm gonna, what is gonna be my next adventure. I try that every adventure is very different. I think my films are like my babies. They'll have my DNA, but definitely they all look different. Yes, very. But there's something common in them. So I want to think about that. My next film has to be something very different from my previous. <laughs> well, that's the power of animation. One animated film can look so different than the last. Completely. And the fact for me that I don't draw is even, even you know, I don't have a style of drawing. So I can work with different artists to make a film that looks completely different from Robot Dreams and it could be animation as well. This is your first animated project, but like all of us, we all, you know, experience different animated films that inspire us. And I'm curious for you, what are some of the animated films that you've seen that are sort of, you know, the cornerstone animated films for you that have inspired you as a director, both for this animated film, but also for your live action work? Well, for me, my, my big reference is the Japanese animation. You know, when I, when I was a, a teenager, I remember on TV, see Marco and Heidi, that, you know, the, the master Takahata was involved in Miyazaki. And definitely when I discover all the films that Studio Ghibli produced, like Totoro, or Chihiro, you know, Kiki, you know, they're all the, you know, and, the, and you know, Princess Kaguya. I don't know, I, I love all whatever Ghibli did. And I'm so happy that, you know, that uh, Toronto opened with the last Miyazaki film. So for me, Japanese animations, it kind of deals with emotions and it's only not action. And of course, there's a lot of action and humor in, 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 uh, in Japanese animation. But I think emotion is a big protagonist. And, and I think what I wanted that Robot Dreams deals about, it, about, about emotion. Also, I love stop motion, you know, although this is a 2D. Oh, yeah. I, for me, there's a lot of stop motion, like my life as a zucchini or Mary and Max. So there's, for me, stop motion worked with, with emotions a lot. I think sometimes 3D and, and 2D they, they think that it, it could only be like for kids and it could be only be comedy and, and, and action. And I think uh, animation could be, can, can do anything. Do you uh, foresee a stop motion project potentially? Could be, you know, could be. I don't know. I love, I, as, as I'm not an artist in the sense that I don't draw, uh, I, if I, I would love to make an animation film in the future. 
you know, an animation that has no limit. I've seen animation made with ice, with sand, with paper. I think the great thing about animation, I think is, is much more challenging than live action because in live action, we have a camera. We always have, okay, you can have a Super 8, a 4K, 2K, you know, but in animation, you can always invent a new way to create the perception of movement. As long as you got like 24 frames per second, it could be done with anything. I do think that in another universe, there is a stop motion <laughs> version of this film that everybody uh, really loves. You know, the art style here in the film is very reminiscent of the original graphic novel, but obviously there are some changes I think that uh, help with the fluidity of the animation and the very specific style you're telling it. And you, this is your first animated project, so I'm curious if you could speak to um, how you, when you read the graphic novel and you were transitioning that style into uh, animation, what were some of the changes you felt you needed to make that you still wanted to capture the original style, but you knew that it, need to, it needed to play a little bit differently on screen? I was very lucky that when I met Sarah Baron, the author of the graphic novel, you know, she just gave me carte blanche. You wow. know, she, did, she didn't get involved in the process of making the film in any aspect. She said, now is your film and do it as you would do it. So in that sense, what I felt about the graphic novel, I love the structure and I love the core, the heart of it and the theme. It talks about friendship, relationships, the fragility, the memory, how, how we overcome the loss. So that as a theme was the, the, the reason why I make this, this film. And graphically, what I felt is that I should keep the, the characters, the design of the characters, close to the, the, the design of Sarah Baron, because they were very simple and very lovable. But the backgrounds, we had to add detail. I, there's one big thing that I, I lived 10 years in New York, and I want to make in, another protagonist the city that doesn't appear in the graphic novel. So the moment I saw that the city of New York could be a protagonist, that was key element. So of course, visually, if you see the, the graphic novel, it's just one artist. When you see the film Robot Dreams, there are hundreds of artists. So it's much more detail and also it's much more dimensional. The artwork of Sarah Baron is, I wouldn't say the word flat, not in a negative way, but it's more flat. And in cinema, you have to work on the illusion of death on the third dimension. And we use 2D animation, a classical, old style animation. So I wanted to make an idea that when the audience see this film, they forget they're watching animation and they even forget that they're watching animals behaving an, as a person. It's anthropomorphic, it's a fable. You mentioned that you designed New York City as a bit of a protagonist here, but I, in watching the film, it almost felt like a bit of an antagonist. I found <laughs> that the, there is a lot of cynicism <laughs> and selfishness that these characters try to endure through in uh, some of the characters in this film, the uh, supporting characters. And I was wondering if that was on your mind at all, if in portraying New York City, there was an intentionality to have to keep that sort of mean-spiritedness that I think, unfortunately, pervades some people in that city. <laughs> It's funny, I, I think you're right. I think this is a protagonist, but at the same time, as an, as, an, as antagonist, definitely, you know. I live in the city of New York. I love New York, but it's a tough city. It was, it was right, definitely yeah. it's antagonism. <laughs> yeah, and definitely there's a, a lot of obstacles that the main characters find in the city it, itself. But still, you know, uh, I, I feel, although I live in Spain right now in Madrid, I feel a New Yorker at heart and I have such a nostalgic element or remember of like what New York was like in the 80s and the 90s, the period that I was living there. So for me, it's a, it's a love letter to New York. So one time goes by and there's some distance, you only think about the good things and that's something about good of the human nature. Speaking to that uh, nostalgia that you're infusing into the film, the sound design choices, particularly the music, I think, are very evocative. Uh, they, you know, get people sort of dancing in their seat while they're watching everything happening. And I would love to hear what went behind choosing which songs you were going to, to feature in the film. Well, the, the thing is so important, not only how the film looks to bring you to a period, how the film sounds the music, but even like how the subway or how the, the streets. So in my case, the music is very important in all my films. And here I'm lucky that I work with my closest collaborator, Yuko Harami. This is also my wife. She's a musician, she's not a composer, but she's the music editor in all my films. So she always helps me to find the, the right temps to, to guide the composer, to find the right 
pop songs and in, in the film uh, Robot Dreams, there's so much music that it really helps you to travel in time. And especially there's one song. The main theme of Robot Dreams is September, the earth, wind and fire. It's not that it appear only once, it appears repeatedly. It's the right. song of robot and dog. So for me, that's the moment I, I thought, wow, this is the song of the film. It was like a, a big key moment for me when that I said, you know, I got the song, I got the main theme. Is that a song that you have a, a personal history with at all? Does it represent anything for you? It does. I, I, <laughs> I think it's the best pop song of all time. I think, <laughs> look, I listen to the song, I don't know, thousands of times. I cannot even, hundreds is too little. Thousands of times before I made this film, but now it's just constantly, and I still haven't got tired. But the, I found it, a connection so clearly, but it was already I started making the film. It's kind of like a, one of those mysterious things. Okay, I decided the song was September, and then, okay, now I'm going to read the lyrics carefully. And the lyric says, do you remember the 21st night of September? I said like, 21st of September? Then my daughter's birthday, so okay. Okay, oh, wow. and for me, films are like my children, okay? <laughs> so that that part, and the first thing it says, do you remember? And for me, the main thing about this film is the memory. The only reason I made this film is to remember the people I lost. So it's a homage to the people I lost. So suddenly in this song, is the memory, the theme of the film, and, and you know, my, and my daughter's birthday. So it had to be this song. There is very minimal dialogue, but uh, there are still some uh, uses of the voice in yes. the film. And, you know, I think that when we're talking about a silent film, it's very different than if we're talking about something where there is, there are voices and there is sound design, but it's very minimal. And I was wondering if you could speak to uh, the 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 uh, sensitivities of still including it in there, but still trying to keep it largely dialogue free. Well, the thing is that I, I agree with you. This is not a silent film. It has no dialogue, but it's not silent because there's very complex sound design. You know, the film takes place in the 80s New York. This has nothing to do with a, a film that I made that it was a silent film that was called Blanca Nieves. It was black and white. It was a homage to the 20s. It has intertitle. This one is not like that. This one is just, they don't have dialogue, but they laugh, they scream, they breathe, and there's sound. For me, it kind of connects with Jack Stati films, mm. you know, that they have no dialogue, but you know, it's just their sounds. And especially with the great master, for me, we ha if I have to talk about the big influences, Chaplin, you know. Chaplin, even when the, when the silent era finished, he still was making a film with no words, like City Lights, you know, so, you know, so I think like there's still many things that we can do without dialogue. You spoke about the themes of friendship in the film, which, is, which are, of course, I think, sort of the cornerstone. And I was wondering if you could speak more to sort of what about the fragility of friendship that you're looking to explore and, and how that ties into things beyond friendship, but also the memories of people who are still living that, you know, we don't see or those who are no longer with us. What were some of the some of the, you know, memories that you were thinking about while you were evoking those feelings? Definitely on the surface, on the graphic novel, you think it's about friendship, you know, is that the main story is like a lonely dog that goes to the home shopping network and just buys a robot and they become best friends. So that's the, on the surface. But the reality, it talks more than friendship. I think maybe kids will see it as a friendship theme, but for adults, I assure you that most of them see it as a love story. And even about people that they lost in the way, it could be somebody that uh, died and it's not or somebody that it just, pass away, I don't know. So for me, it's open. I like the idea that the film is completed by the, by the spectator, the audience. They can make it, and sometimes people that have seen the film, at the end of the film, they told me, I thought about my father died, or I thought about my ex-girlfriend. So I think it's open, you know? And I think what's, what's good about cinema, that it talks to every audience in a, in a different way. Amazing, Pablo, this is such a beautiful film. I'm really excited for everybody to get a chance to see it. Great. Thank you for speaking with us. No, thank you to you. I, I really need that you guys can go with a megaphone and say, come and see Robert Dreams, come and see Robert <laughs> Dreams. Because at the end, this is, you know, it's a, it's a, a European, Spanish, French co-production. It's yeah. not a big studio production. So we so we need we need your help to people go to see it. I will be there out on the streets. <laughs> I'll be shouting out the film from the rooftops. <laughs> Good, thank you. <laughs>